and welcome to program number seven of Understanding Revelation. It is possible to have a better understanding in the book of Revelation. We don't understand all the details, of course not, but and there's specifics, of course, that we don't know, but we can have a better understanding of the whole picture of the book of Revelation. That's what these classes, these sessions are for, for you to have a better understanding of it. So if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the Cornell Ministries YouTube channel, comment, like, uh, share. I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, even if it isn't on this specific program, I'd love to hear your feedback. If it's questions about the, you know, something that we're going to be covering uh, later on, then I might, you know, maybe leave that off. But I'd love to hear your feedback, especially on the today's comments or the series altogether. Uh, as we do at the beginning of every every class, we're going to have a word of prayer and ask the help of the Holy Spirit to give us understanding and also meet your needs. And it's awesome thing about media. A person can be watching this. You can be watching this a day after I've done this this program, a year, three years after, three years later, and the Holy Spirit can take. The prayer, this prayer that we pray in just a moment, or take a word that's said and encourage you and just touch you at your point of need. It's an awesome thing what God can do. So let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And right now we ask you for the help of your Holy Spirit. I ask that God, you would meet every need. That God, you would encourage, Lord, your people. Encourage, Lord, those right now. That person that's watching, Lord, encourage them right now. Lift them up, Lord. Let their faith be anchored in what you have done for them at the cross. And Lord, help their, let their mind be anchored in you as well, that their thoughts would line up with your thoughts towards them. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And I ask and believe you, Lord, for your help and your understanding, revelation knowledge. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Well, on today's class, in today's class, we're going to be taking a look at Revelation chapter 2 and really beginning Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be, in, in today's class, we're, we're going to be doing an overview of the seven churches of Asia, the ones that Jesus addressed in chapters two and three. Uh, there's a chart I'm going to put up on the screen uh, a little later on. As I say in many of the uh, programs, that if you're able to put this up on a, uh, uh, a laptop, a computer screen, TV is really the best if you're able to. I know a lot of people do that with YouTube videos, or if not, just listen. Uh, you, you put it on landscape on your phone or your tablet. Uh, it's the best way to watch this. Uh, I'm going to have a chart and I'll show in just a moment. But let, let's get into it today of Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to begin looking at the four main views of the seven churches. Now, we're going to go through this somewhat quickly because there's going to be some repetition in and as uh, how we approach this. First of all, when Jesus addressed these seven churches of Asia, they were seven literal churches that existed in John's day. And again, we, I believe that this was written uh, in about 95 AD, toward the end of the first century. I think all the evidence, internal, external evidence, leans that way. And so these were seven literal churches in John's day that Jesus was addressing. And this is just a side note here, but it's an incredible that, that Jesus himself is addressing these seven churches. And were there more than seven churches that, that uh, existed in that day? Oh, of course there were. There were, I don't, we don't know how many, but there were at least, I believe, hundreds, if not thousands of churches that existed by the end of the first century, but Jesus chose seven. And seven is, as you might know, in the Bible, it's God's number of perfection, but it also is a number of that, that, that can be used to symbolizing the whole of something, all right? And, and that is what, uh, num leading to number two here, is what the number seven, or these seven churches represent. They, they represent 
seven basic divisions of church history. So they represent really the church as a whole. And one of the things that we see that's very interesting is that each church, uh, beginning with Ephesus and ending with Laodicea, uh, they represent a stage within church history. And it's very interesting how church history, or 2,000 years, or almost 2,000 years of church history, can very easily be divided up into, into seven different stages. And it's very interesting how each one chronologically lines up with the, the characteristics of each church. Now, not perfectly, but in general, the characteristics do line up. So we're going to take a look more at this in just a, in just a bit. They also represent seven types of churches that exist today. And I should add that exist even in John's day. Because when we take a look at each one of the seven churches, again, each one of them are unique. There are similarities that each one of them have, but there are unique uh, qualities or characteristics, good or bad, that each one had. So, for example, in John's day, there were churches like the church of Ephesus. There were churches like the church of Pergamos. There were churches that had the characteristics of the church of Laodicea. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And the same thing exists today. They, separ- they represent seven types of churches collectively, you could say local churches, that exist today. So again, in John's day, there was a, an actual church of Laodicea that were spiritually lukewarm. In John's day, there was the church of Ephesus that they were strong in doctrine, but they had left their first love. Same thing exists today. I believe that it represents seven types of churches, again, local churches collectively that exist today. Uh, And then last one, number four, they represent seven types of individual believers that exist today. And I could, I could, you could say, you could substitute that word today uh, or include with it, I should say, even back then in John's day, seven, uh, they represent seven types of believer, individual believers. So what, what do I mean by that? I mean, what I mean by that is this, that back in John's day, there were Ephesus type believers there were Laodicean type believers, there were Philadelphia type believers, there were Smyrna type believers, there were Pergamos type believers, there were uh, uh, Laodicea, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Thyatira type believers, all right? There, there were those individual type of believers that had the characteristic of those churches. That was the characteristic of that believer. Same thing today, hopefully that makes sense. In today's church, there, you can have one church, collective church, let's call it the, the first, you know, uh, Christian, Pentecostal, Baptocostal church, okay? Uh, and then within that one church, there are Ephesian type believers, there are Pergamos type believers, Smyrna type believers, there are Laodicean type believers, there are Philadelphia type believers, there are Laodicean type believers. All right, individual believers, even within that one church, and, and that I wouldn't say that was would be normal today because normally one collective church would have the main characteristics of you know the of of that body, but within the church today as a whole, there these represent seven types of individual believers, and. Now, in, in re, as I put here, in reality, all four views combined together are true of the seven churches. Seven churches then and the church today, again, as I've been trying to say, uh, uh, but especially then, there were, seven, there were seven literal churches, again, in John's day. Now, that is, that is not true today. I don't know. There there. there there may be a church um, in, in Ephesus. I'm not, I'm not familiar with those areas of the world right now, okay? But in John's day, Jesus was addressing these seven different uh, in literal churches. I think you understand what I'm saying. And to collectively, again, they represent uh, really the, 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 especially two through four, 
the church today, all right? So I ask you the question, and really only God knows the answer to it, but what kind of believer are you? What, where would, what church would you find yourself in? You know, we really ultimately cannot answer that truthfully. We, I, I hope all of us, would, we could say that we're Philadelphia-type believers or we're Smyrna-type believers. Smyrna is the persecuted church. And, but we're, uh, uh, and most in the Western world would not find themselves in that place, even though Paul did say that all those who are in Christ Jesus, we, they will suffer persecution. So at some point in our Christian life, we're going to suffer persecution for the cause of Jesus Christ. And so, but in other parts of the world today, I think of Afghanistan in particular, the thing that's going on right now, hearing reports of believers and pastors being lined up and martyred being killed or women who are raped right in front of their uh, their husbands and and all all and what's their crime is that they're Christians they love Jesus and then don't that's happened right in front of the the father the husband's eyes and then the the woman is killed and then the husband is killed again that's that's real persecution what we go through sometimes you know if a comedian makes a joke you know against Jesus Christ we, we say in today's world, you know, that, oh, well, we're suffering persecution. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's persecution light compared to what's going on much in the world today. All right, I want to put up on the screen uh, something right here. And again, this, and this will, be, will be difficult for you to read unless you put it on a, TV, uh, on a, a laptop, a, a computer screen, or, or again, a TV screen. This would be hard for you to see, but I, I, I put this up here, and also I have put a link in the comments for you to download this chart that I put up on the screen right here, okay? I put it right here. This is what your chart will look at, the set, uh, look like, the seven churches of Revelation. You can download this and print it out if you'd like, or, or download it, just put it on your computer uh, if you'd like. Uh, and I put that in the comments of this video. But um, so look, I'm going to take a look at this. And uh, if you're able to see it on the top left hand corner of the screen or the top of the screen, I should say, it lists each of the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Again, each one of these represents a stage in church history. Now, what I've done, what the reason why I've cr created this chart is to give just a summary of Jesus, how he addressed each one of the seven churches, and also to show the stages within church history. Now, what is interesting about the way that Jesus addressed each one of these seven churches is that he followed a sevenfold pattern as when he addressed each of the seven churches. Now, each of the, now that sevenfold pattern is not given completely in this chart that I've given you. The, the thing that it's lacking is the commission to the each pastor, all right? Because each each letter that Jesus wrote, he begins it with to the angel or the pastor of the church of Ephesus or Smyrna to the angel. All right. He, he writes it, he commissions it to the angel. So that's really the first part. And that's actually not on this chart, but each one of the, the, the uh, each one of the ways that Jesus addressed the churches begins, it can begins with a C and at least in the English. And it, again, it's a sevenfold pattern. It's commission. It's the gives a character description of Christ. You can see it there on the screen. There's a commendation. There is a condemnation. All right. There is a counsel. There is a uh, corrective warning. What also is not given is there is a challenge to hear what the Spirit is saying to the seven churches. And then there is the covenant promise to the one who hears and to the one who overcomes. It's a sevenfold pattern, all right? And again, 
on this chart is given one, two, three, four, five, six. Six of those things are described here. All right. So, uh, but then there's a, again, it follows a sevenfold pattern. We're going to we're gonna just take a look at it quickly. And again, if you download this, you can see it much more clearly or on a TV screen. At the look at Ephesus, number one, is, is called the Apostolic Church. Now, all of these terms that as we go through this, these are all just man-made terms. This, the, the, the breakdown uh, of the timing is all man-made. I just want to let you know that. This is all, this is not, you know, thus saith the Lord, all right? Again, it is very interesting that church history divides itself into seven different stages, and each one of these uh, churches, ha it lines up with that timing of that, of that church, all right? First of all is Ephesus. That, that was the apostolic church, or the first century church. They started off right, had a lot of things going well for them. But they eventually, as Jesus said, left their first love. And, or that's what Jesus had against them. Again, let me say this, that when Jesus addressed these seven churches, within that time frame, there was not just the church of Ephesus. It wasn't just all the churches had left their first love. Not at all. Only the church at Ephesus did Jesus address in that way. All right? But as a stage in church history, collectively, we do see that during that time period that there was um, uh, a leaving of the first love, and we'll take a look at that more in the next class, the, the church of Ephesus, that seemed to be the pattern, all right, of that first century church, especially toward the end of the first century. No, and, and one of the things I wanted to, to, to say here as well is that Jesus, and his, as he addressed each one, he gave a description, a character description of himself. You can see that there in the chart. Uh, he gave a condemnation, commendation, in other words, if there was anything good, that he, had, that he could say about each church, he said it. The only exception is the church of Sardis and the church of Laodicea. And, and think about that for a moment. Jesus, again, anything good that he can say, as that after he commissioned, after he addresses the pastor and after he, he describes himself, all right, he says something good. And that, that is a pattern that Jesus that used here. And, and I think you and I can follow that pattern as well. We should. That if there's anything good to say, that ought to be on the forefront of our mind, rather than having some pessimistic, analytical, you know, when I say analytical, I mean in a negative way, critical mindset of people that everybody is guilty everybody the the, the half is the uh, the, uh, the 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 glass is half empty all right there everybody's just you know bad all right until proven they're good that's a that's a not a good mentality i don't believe that's a christ-like mentality as it concerns people so he had something good to say about them but notice this there's two churches that he didn't that and even Jesus didn't have anything good to say about them. Now that's pretty bad. When Jesus himself, who has eyes like flame of fire, he sees it all. When he can't say anything good about you, that's pretty bad. And that was the church of Sardis, and that was the church of Laodicea. And remember, these were churches, legit churches, in which within them there were legit saved people. All right, but collectively, again, Jesus didn't have anything good to say about them. And then there was the condemnation, all right? Condemnation, for example, for the Ephesus, you've left your first love. Pergamus, you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. Thyatira, you allow Jezebel to seduce and teach immorality and idolatry. Sardis, you have a name that you're alive, but you are dead, and your works are not perfect before God. Uh, Laodicea, you're lukewarm. All right, you're look So that's the condemnation. But notice, just like with the commendation, the good things, he had nothing good to say about Sardis and Laodicea. In the condemnation, 
he had nothing bad to say about Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. I think that's awesome as well, that Jesus has nothing bad to say about those churches. It doesn't mean that those churches collectively were perfect, or, I mean, when you picked them apart, of course, you, if, whenever there's people, you have an imperfect church, all right? <laughs> but overall, Jesus didn't see anything that, that, caused, that would cause him to say, hey, this, this really needs to be correct. Of course, were there, were there corrections in every church? I mean, because there were people, the answer is always a yes. But to the point where Jesus felt led, of course, and saw that there was a need to say, hey, re this is really out of order and this needs to be addressed. Jesus didn't have anything like that to say about Smyrna and about Philadelphia. And I, I think and I can read, I, I, I can tell what, what some of you are thinking. I want to be like that. I want to be that type of, in that type of church. I want to be in that type of believer in which Jesus knows that there's work to do, but on the big, uh, overall, he's not, he doesn't look at us and say, well, you know what, that's really, really out of order and you know you've left your first love or you have the doctrine of Balaam you're following that you know or you're you have you're following the doctrine of Laodicea or you're lukewarm but Jesus you know he doesn't have anything like that to say about us there's the counsel that Jesus gives to each one you can see it there on the screen remember from where you have fallen and repent he said that to Laodicea I'm moving on with Thyatira. Do not, do not hold to, this, to the doctrine of, of Jezebel and hold fast to what you have until I come. So there were believers in the church of Thyatira that were not following the, church of, uh, or the doctrine of Jezebel. Then there was the corrective warning. Uh, uh, if, in other words, if they did not repent and if they did not listen to the, the challenge, which is, I, get, and I don't have it on here in this, on, the, on the chart, but the challenge for each church was hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And to each one who, here was the corrective warning, if you don't hear, and if you don't repent, then this is what Jesus said. And he said to the church of Ephesus, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand. To the church of Pergamos, I will come to you quickly and fight against you with the sword from my mouth. That was that's with my word. I will you'll be judged by my word quickly. Uh, Thyatira, I will cast her into a sickbed and into great tribulation, and kill her and will kill her children with death. Mm, wow! And the list and the list goes on for each one of the churches. But I want to go back to the the stage of church history. Again, Church of Ephesus, the apostolic church from 30 to 100 AD. Again, that's a man-made time frame, all right? But they eventually left their first love as a whole. Again, not every individual believer in that. I think you get the point. The next stage of church history was, was and it's, this is very interesting. Again, this is why this, we look at these stages here and follow the pattern of each church. The next stage within church history, again, generally from 100, and we could really, again, these are, these are, there's wiggle room with these time frames here, because right before 100, you had uh, the time frame of Domitian, which John was under, which was in the mid 90s uh, AD. All right, so you could take this even further earlier, but generally speaking, 100 to 313 AD. Over well over 200 years, there were it was severe persecution, primarily uh, by the Roman Empire upon believers, upon those who called themselves Christians. All right, and uh, I've read one, one commentator I read years ago said estimated anywhere between two to three million Christians were killed during that time frame. And again, remember, there was a lot less people on the earth during that time, less believers during that during that time. So when we say two to three million in today's thinking, that may not seem like that much. But in that time, over that, that time frame, that was a lot 
believers lost their lives. They were, I mean, uh, and it wasn't constant, all right? It wasn't consistent all throughout that time period, but it, there were seasons of persecution, primarily because of Roman emperors that, that, that hated Jesus. Uh, and then there was the compromising church, Pergamus, all right? Uh, 313 to 607 B, uh, AD, all right? Th why, why 313? 313 is the year that Constantine became the Roman Empire, emperor. And Constantine accepted Christianity. A lot that could be said about that. But Constantine became a Christian. And there's different thoughts about, you know, whether Constantine was real or whether it was, you know, fake, you know, whether it was just a, a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. I mean, arguments could be made towards that. But arguments could be made that what he had was legit that he did truly convert to Christ. Well, anyway, when he became emperor, get this, Christianity went from being persecuted to being accepted. All right, and, and then eventually, and this is eventually what happened toward the end of the fourth century, the end of the fourth century is the 300s, the end of the 300s, uh, I, I think it was Emperor Theodor Theodorus that... Uh, if I'm getting his name correctly, the, under him, not only was Christianity accepted, but Christianity was now uh, was now made legal. And when I say legal, I mean I'm, uh, not not just accepted and made. Uh, Constantine made it legal, made it accepted, but under that Theodorus, if I if his name if his name is correct, I have his, I have his name here somewhere. Uh, that Roman emperor in 381 AD, around that time period, he made, he, made, he made Christianity not only legal, but it was forced. It was forced. In other words, you had to become a Christian. Good. So get that, within one century, the fourth century, Christianity went from being persecuted all right, you were persecuted if you were a Christian, to now, at the end of the 4th century, you were persecuted if you were not a Christian. And that was, is called the compromising church, because what happened during that time frame, between 313, really to 607, and in 607, that date is used, it's a date that a lot of historians use as the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. Personally, I believe it was formed much earlier than that, but the Roman Catholic Church was formed through compromise, all right? Compromise with the, what, what the Romans referred to as the barbarian peoples that were coming from the north, all right? Invading uh, the Roman Empire, all right? And to compromise or to have peace with them, they compromised Christianity and, and accepted all kind of heathen practices, but converted them, you could say, when I say converted them, put a, converted them into a Christian heathen practice. For example, like the worship of Mary. For example, like the worship of the saints. That was just a heathen practice, all right? Not Mary, but a worship of a woman, all right, but they just made it Mary, worship of dead people, they just converted that into saints, heathen practice that were now Christianized. That happened during that time period. That's when the Roman Catholic Church was formed. All right, 607 to 1517, uh, the Thyatira, that represents the Papal Church or the Roman Catholic Church. During that time period, as many refer to it as the Middle Ages or the or during that time frame was the Dark Ages, when false doctrine was so prevalent under the Roman Catholic Church. Thyatira, they accepted, in general, they accepted the, the doctrine of Jezebel, which uh, promoted uh, immorality, idolatry. And you see during that time period of the Roman Catholic Church that that idolatry was huge and even immorality was huge it was veiled it was be, it was it was not up in 
front, in front of your face type of immorality. It was behind the scenes, but it was still promotion of immorality, all right? And definitely promotion of idolatry during that time frame. And then you get to the church of Sardis, which is the dead church. Now, that was 1517 to 1700. Now, that is a time frame, and I have to be very, I'm just be honest with you, open with you, be honest with you about everything, but open with you on this, is now this is one of those stages that personally, I, you know, I, I, I see it, but I, I don't, because this, this is the time period in 1517, this is when the Reformation began. All right, under in 1517. This is when the church became alive. All right, it was dead for so many years, and, and maybe, maybe what can happen, or what you can do is you can really you can mesh some of these these stages into each other because what happened with the chap the papal church is that they became dead. They had a name that they were alive, but they were in rea in reality dead. And under the Reformation, they became, the church became alive again. I'm not meaning the Roman Catholic Church didn't become alive. No, no. But there was a, the, the true church was birthed out of the Reformation. God used men like Martin Luther, uh, John Huss before him, John Wycliffe, the Morning Star of the Reformation in the, in the 1300s in, in England. God used men like Ulrich Zwingli and many, many others during that time frame. Uh, William Tyndale, uh, again, many others, John Calvin even, even though, again, we di I disagree with the point, the five main points of Calvinism, but John Calvin was a re true reformer, and he believed in ju strongly pushed justification by faith and the authority of God's word. Really, all of the five solas, he, John Calvin, supported them. Again, I disagree with the five points of Calvinism, the, the tulip principle, but nevertheless, he was a reformer. And then we have the church of, uh, uh, or let me just address this, that what happened with the Reformation church is that they did, they did uh, go back into formalism and a spiritual deadness but it was just under a different name. It wasn't now. It wasn't now. It wasn't Roman Catholic spiritual deadness. Now it was Protestant spiritual deadness, and under a list of all different type of names, it was Lutheran spiritual deadness. It was Anglican spiritual deadness, and the list goes on. All right. So it was a church that was alive, but they became dead, and that was the characteristic of the of the Church of Sardis. You have a name that you're alive but you're dead. And then we get to, the, to Philadelphia, the missionary church. From about the year 1700 to the, to the year 1960, again, these are man-made time frames. Why 1700? It's because 1700, it was around that time period that William Carey from England, he's called the father of modern missions. He is the one, or God used him in a, in a great way uh, kind of as a, as a forerunner, not a forerunner, but as a leader to some degree in the in the uh, modern mission movement. He was from England, but God called him to go preach the gospel and be a missionary in India. And it let and, and it wasn't just him. He didn't stir it up. It was the Holy Spirit that was stirring it up. That primarily uh, believers from Europe went all over the world, including America, all right, including America, and, and the Americas, I should say, North America, Central America, South America, that missionaries came over during that time period, uh, and, and then that it would eventually go into the uh, beginning of the, uh, the 20th century with the Azusa Street Revival, and that way, the, in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and now Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered Pentecostal missionaries went all over the world. And in the 20th century, get this, saw more people won to Christ in the 20th century than any other century in man and in, in humankind. Now get that. When the, through the, Azusa Street Revival and other revivals that God was 
stirring up during that time, including the Welsh Revival. There were many other revivals in which God was pouring out His Spirit, and what God was doing, and, and He did this, uh, uh, Azusa Street is a good reference point. God brought back, I should say, mankind or believers welcome back the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. The church welcomed that back in the beginning of the 1900s. And it spurned a and stirred up a missionary movement in which in, in the 20th century saw more people won to Christ than any other century in humankind, I mean, in, in mankind's history, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. All right? And so that was that time frame. In the 1960s, what do I say? Why is that time frame given 1960? It's because 1960 is when there was a shift in within the church, and it's when uh, liberal theology, and this is really goes way be this goes back to the middle of the 1800s, is when liberal theology began to make inroads in the Church of England, uh, or uh, at the begin to begin with, but then. In the early 1900s, liberal theology began to creep into the American church, and liberal theology doubted the authority of God's word, doubted the deity of Christ, uh, doubted the, uh, the the sinful condition of humanity. Uh, and when you get when you doubt those, doubted the doubted the gospel, you know, you know, in in ways, you know, if you doubt the authority of God's word, you doubt. The, the deity of Christ. You doubt the, um, the uh, sinfulness of mankind. All right? You doubt those three things, and you really, and there's other things as well, but you doubt those things, you have a corrupted gospel. And that's what began to happen. And it kind of reached a peak more in the, it began to reach a peak in the 1960s. And I know in the 1960s, 60s, we had the Jesus movement in which there was I mean, hundreds of thousands of people saved, if not more than that, well, more than that, over, well over a million or millions of people that got saved during that time period, period genuinely saved, all right? But yet, nevertheless, there was a, a decline in the church and a gradual decline. And it began to get the mindset of the church of Laodicea which today very much is the mindset overall, okay, in, in, in general, that the mindset is we're rich, increase with goods, and have need of nothing. Now, does, that's overall, okay, in general. And I think, I believe with my heart that, all my heart, that the mindset of the church of Laodicea is more prevalent than believers in general than they, they actually think, especially in the West or in parts of the world where there is no persecution. I, I think uh, that it's more prevalent than we realize. But with that said, that is it's true of the church in general. But even today, in today's church, there are Philadelphia, Philadelphia type believers that they're evangelistically, evangelistically minded, they, uh, or not just evangelism, but their heart, evangelism, but their heart is, is, is all out for Jesus, to go through the doors that he opens. They're obedient to God. There are those type believers today. There are Sardis type believers. They got a name that they're alive, but they're dead. There are, there are Thyatira type believers. They're, they're, that's primarily Roman Catholic, all right? Uh, they are Pergamus type believers and compromising. There are Smyrna type believers. They're believers. They're they love the Lord with all their heart. They're 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 on fire, but they're they're in a very persecuted environment. That's very prevalent in the world in some parts of the world today. And then there's Ephesus type believers that they strong in doctrine, but deficient in love. And they and without even realizing it. Because they're so strong in doctrine, they have left that personal aspect of loving Jesus and their faith being personally uh, in what Christ has done. And, 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 and we can even have just the head knowledge about the cross and it be just more head knowledge than we realize. 
It has to be something that grips our heart. So uh, that is an overview of the seven churches of Asia, the seven churches given in Revelation. And again, you can download this chart. You can see it on the link in the comments. I pinned it at the top. And hopefully you can, you can download it there. But uh, uh, again, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, other than that, God bless you. He loves you. Have a, have a wonderful day in Jesus.